Talking with Martians, a panel on Red Planet Research. Tonight, we have three wonderful pan panelists who are all Mars researchers. Devarati Das, a PhD student, Aaron Gibbons, PhD student, and Richard Leveille, professor at McGill University. They're all part of Department and Earth and of Earth and Planetary Sciences. So to start things off, each panelist is going to give a short introduction of themselves and their work. Then we will go right into questions. So if you're on Zoom and you wanna ask a question, just type it into the chat. If you're on YouTube and you'd like to ask a question, you can type it into the chat beside the live stream or in the comments. Those questions will be fed to me and I will feed them to the, to the panelists. We also got some questions submitted uh, earlier to the event as well. So you might hear your question come up, come up then. The event will go until around eight, until around 8 p.m. Uh, and with that, I will pass it off to Devarati, who will introduce herself to you. All right. Okay, I'm gonna do a quick check. Can you see my screen? Can you see the lasers? Um, are they moving? My yeah, laser moving. It's not moving. Okay, I will reshare this because that is critical. The laser needs to move. All right, let's start this again. Oh boy, this one is not moving either. Oh, is it moving? Perfect. Yes. All right. Good start. Okay, so uh, hi, I'm Devarati. Um, today I'll be talking to you about chasing water on Mars with lasers. Um, you can find me on Twitter if you have questions more uh, than time permits. I am a graduate student at Earth and Planetary Science Department at McGill University. And so, okay, I have a, <laughs> I have a, a introductory slide. This is, this is me. Um, like I said, I'm a graduate student at McGill University. I am a member of NASA's Mars Science Laboratory team. I'm also a National Geographic Explorer um, and I study uh, rocks from Death Valley as an analog um, for stuff on Gale Crater. Um, I also study data from the Curiosity River and I study these white squiggly lines in rocks of Mars. Um, so yeah, please ask all the questions. I'll be happy to answer them. So what do I do? Um, I study the element boron using the laser instrument on the Curiosity River to understand the past water activity on Mars. This is a very general, you know, elevator pitch of what I do. So here are the squiggly lines. I'll be talking a little bit more about this um, with you. What, but let's start with why boron? Um, boron is the fifth element, the OG cool element. It's very water soluble, so it goes where the water goes. Um, and you can look at, the, you can see this picture over here and you'll see these white squiggly lines, that'll be the theme of this presentation. Um, they're kind of going across these rocks. So uh, the, this is from a <clears throat> borate mine in California. So what happened here is that water that was rich in borates and minerals kind of traveled through cracks in rocks. And uh, once the water evaporated, they were left behind. So they're a good proxy for what the water could have been a you know, borate rich mineral present in uh, evaporite setup is a good proxy for what kind of water would have been present uh, when liquid water is not actually there for us to sample, which is quite useful when it comes to Mars because the surface of Mars does not have any liquid water today. Um, why is this research awesome? Boron means water. And as a bonus, uh, boron is also known to, borate ions are known to support um, important prebiotic uh, molecules on Earth. So molecules like <clears throat> ribonucleic acid. Um, so boron kind of keeps its structure intact and preserves it and prolongs its life. So this means, you know, there's a potential for life and that potential itself on Mars is quite amazing. So what is my field area. On Mars, my field area is Gale Crater. Here's the landing ellipse. Here's a picture of um, Gale Crater. And this is the, the central mound. I'm sure Richard and um, Aaron will talk a little bit more about, maybe not because they're working on Perseverance. Um, but this is where the Curiosity rover <clears throat> landed. Um, and it's kind of my field area. But how do I measure boron on Mars? 
with lasers, of course. Here's the Curiosity rover. This is the head of the Curiosity rover. It's the ChemCam suite. And on the ChemCam suite, it has this little eye, which is called LIBS. And with LIBS, we blow shut, shut up in Mars. Just kidding. <laughs> we do blow it up, but not at this scale. The actual blow up is very small. As you can see, this one is an actual image. Um, it, it's a little gif uh, from, it's a composite of uh, the laser hitting the Martian soil. And you can see this is the scale over here. So what the, the LIBS, which stands for, for laser induced breakdown spectroscopy, uh, hits the, it's a high powered laser that hits the rocks or soil on, on Mars. It turns it into plasma, elevates its energy. And as the energy is cooling down, um, it, it gives out characteristic wavelengths, which is then captured by a camera, which helps us understand what the chemistry of the rock is. So the wavelengths will tell us what elements there are and the intensity will tell us how much, relatively how much of it is uh, there. So if you can look at this graph over here, this is what the data looks like basically. So, um, well, so what exactly is the boron story? You know, why is it important? So I'll give you a very generalized um, cartoon of what we think is happening. And of course, this is not a comprehensive, you know, detailed um, story of what may be happening. This is just a very broad picture of what we think could be happening. So this is an image of Gale Crater, but don't be fooled. Um, we don't know if Mars was, you know, a very wet, uh, it didn't, it may not have had prolonged wet periods, but there was water at some point. So this is Gale Crater and Gale Crater formed by a, a crater impact. So the base was cracked and at a wetter period, may have been intermittent short periods of water coming in, got in all kinds of sediments, dumped it in Gale Crater. And the water, we think, probably got stored up in the cracks um, on the floor of Gale Crater. Eventually, this water dried off. And as the water was drying off, it was starting to become more enriched uh, and starting to become more briny with elements, water soluble elements like boron, lithium, uh, uh, salt, you know, and that water also affected the water underground, the groundwater. Eventually that surface water also went away and it, you know, uh, rendered the sediments vulnerable to, um, what do you call it, weathering. And once that pressure was lifted, all this water or can, can now just get injected into the overlying rocks. So that's what we think happened, which, um, led all this briny water to kind of cross cut through the weak, weak planes of the rocks. And eventually this water also dried off, leaving behind the squiggly lines uh, that we see. The squiggly lines are basically evaporites, which are uh, minerals that form when water dries off. Um, what we see on Mars are called calcium sulfates or on Earth we commonly know it as gypsum. Um, and this is really cool because they're kind of like, you know, the last vestiges of water on Mars, liquid water on, in Gale Crater at least. Um, so that's the story on Mars, but we don't have geologists on Mars. As much as I would love to just focus on these lovely squiggly lines, I can't. So we kind of uh, found Earth analogs and I found this in Death Valley. Um, these are the, these are some pictures I got uh, from my field trip two years ago. Wow, two years ago, that's been a while. Um, and National Geographic gave me money to do that. Thank you for that. And um, got some samples back and um, it was awesome because when I went there and I saw this amazing landscape, it really reminded me of the pictures that I was seeing um, from Gale Crater and I was really excited to bring them back, um, crush them up, analyze them with uh, Lib's um, equivalent at, at our lab. It looks a little bit different. It looks like this box as you see over, over here on the right, right side. And I turned them into these little pellets and I've been analyzing, analyzing them. And in fact, I'll be giving the results to Richard on Friday. So hopefully that'll be exciting. And <clears throat> so looking forward, <clears throat> I'm kind of trying to bring Mars observations together and Earth observations. And at the same time, I'm also doing some theoretical modeling, trying to understand what could have uh, Mars water looked like. So with that, hopefully uh, we'll get a comprehensive understanding of what past water activity on Mars was like. And I update my research 
findings, uh, some exciting stories from field on a blog. It's called uh, Field Notes. It's a National Geographic Explorer blog. And if you want to le learn more about it, you can go Google Finding Mars in Death Valley. And with that, I will stop my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Fantastic. Thank you, Devarati. Uh, yeah, everyone, you can you can start typing questions in the chat now so that you don't forget them, but we will pass them on to Devarati after our other panelists have introduced the, introduced themselves. So Aaron, please go ahead and share screen. Sure thing. Okay, so let me get this shared. You should be seeing my screensaver right now, which just happens to be a beautiful picture of um, a cliff face that we took a picture of on Mars um, back at the beginning of the Perseverance mission, so a couple months ago. That's my screensaver. That's not what we're talking about today, though. Um, all right, so now you should have my presentation up. Um, so this is me. My name is Erin Gibbons. Just like Leah mentioned, I am a PhD student uh, at McGill University in the Earth and Planetary Science Department. My research focus is on astrobiology. So that is, you can look at the words, see astro and biology, much like an astrophysicist may study, you know, the physics of the cosmos, the stellar motion, the motion of the planets. We study as astrobiologists, the biology of the stars, the, the possibility of life in the cosmos, life amongst the stars is what the word translates to. Um, so how we do that, just like Devarati gave us a spectacular introduction to, is we, we start on Earth. Um, and so I actually did get my, um, my introduction to astrobiology during my undergraduate thesis. And it's because I had this incredible opportunity to join a NASA project called BASALT. That is our mission patch in the middle of my screen there. And BASALT, it's a, it's a very clever uh, project name for, for this research because it is both an acronym, an acronym and the name of a rock that is fundamental to the study of Mars. And I actually have a little piece Right here, if you can see my screen, it's this beautiful, scraggly, shiny black rock. It's a black volcanic rock. It's that rock that we're standing on and all of these photos up on your screen. And it is what forms when, when a volcano belches out a lava that is rich in, in iron and magnesium. And then that, that, that lava, it cools down and it forms this crusty black rock called basalt. And this basaltic rock is what makes up the bulk of the Martian crust, this rock is all over the surface of Mars, but it's actually quite sparse on Earth. It's, it's very common under our oceans, but it's difficult to find um, exposures of basalt uh, that are open to the air on Earth. And so we have to go to special places like Hawaii and Iceland in order to find it. And so this NASA basalt team uh, was a team of scientists and engineers and astronauts and we dressed up kind of like astronauts, but with less of, less of the suits, we had big backpacks and hiking poles and lots of equipment. And we trekked out to Hawaii to start looking at these precious basaltic rocks, which I brought many home with me for memories. And what we were doing um, is we were actually looking at the biology associated with these rocks. Because like I said, basalt uh, is also a very clever acronym. It translates to, if I can remember correctly, biologic analog science associated with lava terrains. And that just means we were looking at the biology associated with these lava, these dried lavas, these volcanic rocks. We wanted to know if certain textures, you see all the different textures in these photos or different colors um, would encourage different life forms to colonize these rocks. We wanted to know what kind of microbial communities could exist and if, if the chemistry of these rocks would affect how many microbes we get or maybe their biodiversity. The thinking being that if we understand what kind of life can live on these basaltic rocks on Earth, then maybe, just maybe, that'll help us predict where to look for that life when we go to Mars. And that is so important because we now have a rover on Mars, the Perseverance rover, specifically dedicated to this task. So I was so enthralled um, by the possibility that I could spend my life looking for aliens basically beyond Earth, that that could be a career. Um, that after, after this undergraduate thesis, I went off to McGill, I met Richard, and we have begun this wonderful graduate school journey um, into hopefully becoming a professional astrobiologist one day. And so I've had this um, incredible opportunity to uh, join the NASA Mars 2020 mission, which saw the landing of the Perseverance rover and its uh, twin friend, the Ingenuity drone. Uh, it landed on the surface of Mars back in February. And I'm one of the very, very lucky scientists who actually gets to help operate the Perseverance rover. I get to help make the strategic decisions about where that rover drives and which rocks we should study in detail. 
Um, and all of this is, of course, in service to the main mission objective, which is to study the ge geology and climate of the landing site, as well as for the very first time, seek direct signs of past life on Mars. And so this is why we study Earth first, we get those skills, we get that expertise so that we can do this on Mars, because now we are doing science 250 million kilometers away, so we have to train well first. Now, to give us the best chance of finding these little tiny micro fossils on Mars 250 million kilometers away with a remote rover, we have sent Perseverance to a spectacular location on the surface. It's very compelling. This place is what we call Jezero Crater. This beautiful circular structure that I'm showing you up on your screen here, this is, um, it was a basin that was excavated into the Martian surface about 4 billion years ago when a meteorite struck the surface, carved out this massive basin and formed this beautiful hole. Now there's lots of craters on Mars, um, but this one is especially exciting to us because if you look closely, you can see this beautiful channel flowing in on the left. And we think that that is an ancient river that carved its way across the landscape and emptied into this big basin, filling it up and up and up with water forming a very deep lake so deep that it actually burst out the other side um, in another river that left that crater. So we think that this was a very active, very dynamic lake environment. And you know, it, it could have been a really great place for some Martian microbe to have gained a foothold and, and made a life three or four billion years ago on Mars. And so this is why we sent the Perseverance rover there. We'd really like to have a good look around, look in those rocks, look in that ancient lake bed, and see if we can find any fossils, any, any traces of life that may have found a home in this ancient lake. And what's particularly exciting about this mission is that this will actually be the very first time that a rover will collect samples to send them back to Earth, because we know that our best chance of finding life on Mars is if we look at it back here on Earth. Our best laboratories, our best scientists are right here on Earth. So, and although our, our rovers are incredibly sophisticated, they can only carry so much equipment. They can only do so much from such a far distance. And so we wanna um, pick up those rocks. Perseverance is gonna be storing rocks in one of those sample tombs I'm showing you on the left side there. It's gonna be storing those on the rover. And in a couple of years from now, maybe a decade or so, another spacecraft is gonna fly its way to Mars, pick up those tubes, those samples that we've collected, fly them all the way back to earth for us to study. And so maybe, if the McGill Space Institute invites me back for a panel in another decade or so, we can start to talk about the very first results of the very first samples returned from Mars looking for the very first signs of life beyond our planet. So I'd be thrilled for that panel. And with that, I will turn it over to Richard and then we can get into a Q&A to talk about this exciting research. Thanks all for coming. Thanks so much, Erin. Uh, yeah, feel free to type questions for Aaron into the chat right now. We'll pass them off after Richard has presented. I know that he is also very excited about the possibility of getting samples back from Mars. And certainly it won't be me around inviting you back from that panel, but that would be freaking great. So Richard, <laughs> Well, whoever ahead. does the inviting, uh, I'm sure we'd all be happy to come back. And uh, wouldn't that be awesome if we can uh, talk about samples from Mars? And so... Uh, I'll just say a few things about, uh, you know, this, this idea of searching for life on Mars uh, with rovers, uh, among other things. And uh, I'll get right into it with, um, of course, I could show some amazing pictures of uh, this is the launch of Perseverance and the landing of Perseverance, the amazing uh, images from the sky crane. And most recently, the picture of the sample that Aaron was just telling you about in the, uh, the drill uh, at the end of the uh, robotic arm of Perseverance. So uh, all amazing stuff. But I really want to remind people that you know, planetary exploration is a human endeavor. And it's one that's very collective. You know, it's for everyone. It's collaborative. It involves you know, scientists and engineers and all kinds of people. It's also lengthy and complex. We don't, you know, it's not just one mission. It's multiple missions. Uh, one after the other, and sometimes together, operating together and helping out uh, each other and uh, moving forward uh, in, in our new knowledge. And of course, aided by these wonderful technologies. And if you don't believe me, I'll take you back to uh, August of 2012. Uh, so this is nine years ago at uh, NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab in uh, Pasadena. And this was landing night for the Curiosity rover. 
Ernst was uh, a part of the science team, which is, you know, over 400 people, just the scientists, not the engineers, not the people who built the spacecraft, but the scientists who are actually trying to figure out stuff, uh, like Debarati uh, was, was explaining in her, her part of the story. Uh, so a wonderful experience uh, working with a, a large group like this, at times with a few challenges, as you can imagine, but really a great uh, opportunity to work Work with all these amazing people and uh you know as soon as the first images came down people were talking about what they could see the rocks you know the the features you can see sort of the black and white picture uh on the right there of like the shadow of curiosity so just an amazing experience and, and working with these people you know whether you're a student or a senior researcher you can have an idea you can have some input because of course no one really understands anything at first about what we're seeing on mars and um uh just just a great experience and and to get into the really nitty gritty human details you know i like to show these pictures this is from one of the fridges at uh, at jpl and uh if you know curiosity you'll know that apxs is one of the instruments and in fact that's the instrument on the arm of curiosity and sam is the analytical instrument on on the body of curiosity and so this is a sam coffee milk and the apxs peanut butter in the fridge at jpl and this is another instrument the kemen instrument this is the pi's car in the parking lot and Kemen 4 is the fourth version of Kemen. The other three are prototypes that didn't go to space. So this is really when my story started in terms of actually working on Mars. And I got to do a, a little bit of work with, uh, this is with the ChemCam instrument. Uh, so like uh, the story with uh, calcium sulfate veins that uh, Debarti uh, just showed you, uh, this is a, a different kind of vein or, or filled fractures. So of course the rocks were fractured as was nicely shown. Water went through them. And in this case, rather than calcium sulfates, these are what we think are magnesium clays. And, uh, you know, there's some, there's some geochemistry here. You don't have to worry about the details. Uh, clay minerals are uh, abundant on Mars. They're common alteration products from when we alter rocks like those basalts that Aaron told you about. Uh, so you interact those with water and you'll get clay minerals as what we call alteration product. Uh, but so the, the color image on the left is a mass cam image showing you, you know, the, the region that we looked at, you know, these rocks and there's a scale bar of five centimeters, but the black and white image sort of in the middle of the screen is the chem cam imager, which shows you where the lasers hit. And these, these ridges are these features that kind of stick out from the rock. And the point I'm trying to show you is that we can analyze things that are on the scale of a millimeter or a little bit less with uh, chem cam and now with super cam. So it's pretty amazing. And on the right, what it's showing you is we can fire continuously and we can uh, basically remove material after each laser shot. We sort of remove a little bit of material and we're effectively doing a depth profile. So this is, uh, this is what we call three dimensions or 3D analyses and looking at the rock chemistry and how it changes both you know, horizontally and vertically uh, with depth. So that's pretty amazing. And of course, this contributes to the story of water on Mars, uh, the, 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 the complexity of that water, how much was there, how long it was. And of course, the story of water on Mars is important because we want to understand uh, places where life could exist. And we think that liquid water is probably a requirement for life, at least life as we know it. And so as Aaron introduced, here's Perseverance, um, uh, uh, checking out the uh, Rochette rock where it uh, collected its sample. And, and Aaron just told you about that. Uh, so this is one of its selfies. You can see the tracks in the background there. And uh, sample return is potentially very important for this story uh, of, of uh, detecting life. And I just want to give you a quick introduction to this idea of searching for signs of life or what we call biosignatures. Now, there's a lot on this slide, uh, but biosignatures are, are things that indicate life could have existed in the past and, and are maybe preserved in an ancient rock. So these are the kinds of things we might be looking for. We might be looking for certain minerals, uh, certain textures, uh, certain chemical compositions, et cetera, et cetera. And perseverance can, in theory, uh, detect five of these six categories of biosignatures. Now, in reality, and as Aaron hinted at, uh, we're really probably going to require return samples to make sense of what we may be finding on Mars and to really sort of conclude that if indeed it's there, that there are indeed signs of life. And so we'll require those detailed analyses that we can do back home. And just as an example, here's a, a sample of a stromatolite, which is a, uh, a common fossil on Earth. It's some of the oldest evidence of life on Earth. These are microbial mats that have been mineralized and fossilized. Uh, this one is almost three and a half billion years old. 
And the team, the Perseverance team, looked at this with uh, the Pixel instrument and the Sherlock instrument. And they can make maps of you know, chemical elements and minerals and maybe some organic compounds that are found. But it's really hard to sh show proof that this is indeed a biological construction or sign of life. And that's you know, so with something that we know that it is. So imagine a rock that might have some minor traces of some kind of uh, life form on Mars. And uh, so we'll bring some samples back. And uh, you know, if we don't find life there, maybe we'll find life somewhere else. And of course, as the theme tonight is uh, Mars, but it's really a story of two planets, Earth and Mars, because we like to study things on Earth, to try and understand what we might find on Mars and to develop strategies like where to look on Mars for signs of life, how to look and what to look for. And this is uh, some other work that uh, we've been doing on uh, looking at lava tubes. So Aaron talked about lava flows and basalt a rock. Uh, lava tubes can form and lava flows are pretty common on Earth. And we think there are some on Mars as uh, seen in the image on the left. And these would be really interesting because they're subsurface environments. So they're not as exposed to the elements, if you will, on the surface of Mars. So we think these could be really interesting places to go search for life sometime in the future. And as you can see, some of them are quite big on Mars, even bigger, tens of meters, and some of them are quite small. Uh, again, I think I'm going to cut this short. We found cold adapted microbes in some of these caves uh, living where there's ice in them, which is interesting because on Mars, of course, things are very cold. And so there's uh, Brady O'Connor, another McGill PhD student, uh, chiseling away. to try and understand the distribution of minerals and organic compounds in there. And Raman spectroscopy is a technique that can be used by both the SuperCam and the Sherlock instrument on Perseverance. So we're, we're, we're learning how to do things and what kind of things to look for and understand the science of certain environments on Earth to eventually take that to, uh, take that to uh, Mars. And so I'll just end there and, and thank the students, uh, two of which are here tonight. And uh, we'll be very happy to talk uh, talk more about all this and answer some of your questions. Fantastic, thank you, Richard. So those are our three panelists there. So now it's time for it's time for questions. We already have many lined up. Want to offer another option too? If you would like to ask your question out loud to the panelists and you are on Zoom, you can go down to the bottom tab. You should see a thing called reactions, and you can click raise hand. And if you raise your hand, I will unmute you, and you can ask your question live. But uh, for those on YouTube, just type them in the chat and Zoom chat's fine too. You can also DM uh, Simon as well on Zoom. Anyway, we'll get the question to the panelists. So starting out, uh, first, um, Aaron, someone would like to know, what does a molecular fossil look like? Ooh, that's a very good question. Um, well, to your naked eye, it looks like nothing. <laughs> So what we what we look at is um, they're very small. They're, they're molecular fossils of microbial organisms. So not only are we looking at teeny tiny organisms, much smaller than the eye can see, but we're actually just looking for the chemical traces that they leave behind. So what we find when we, um, the, as scientists, when, when, when we study life on Earth, um, all the way up from the, the, the North Pole to the South Pole, to the bottom of oceans, to the, to the tops of mountains, we find that all life fundamentally is made of the same basic biochemical structures. We are all composed of the same basic biomolecules. Um, and so these include things like DNA, proteins, sugars, carbohydrates, and lipids. And these are the fundamental ingredients that make up life as we understand it. Every organism we have ever discovered, we have ever encountered has these molecules. And some are better as biosignatures than others. So for example, DNA is an undeniable sign of life. If we found a molecule of DNA on Mars, we would know that something was alive there. We would know that it is a signature of life, it's un undisputable. The problem with DNA is it's very fragile and it decays. As soon as that organism dies, DNA is gonna die on a scale of between 10 to about a thousand years. It's not gonna persist in the rock record for much longer. And we think that Mars was habitable billions, three, four billion years ago. So we're looking for a piece of DNA to survive that long. It's just not a promising path forward. So the type of biosignature that I want to focus on is something called a lipid. And every single cell that makes up an organism 
has a lipid membrane that binds all of the, it, it's what separates the inside of the cell from the outside of the cell. So every cell has a lipid membrane. And these lipids are important because they are very hearty. When that organism dies, it's a, if a lipid gets buried in the rock record, it can survive for millions and billions up to, we found kind of two, three billion year old lipids on earth. So we are, these are the most optimistic chemical signatures of life that we have, this, this lipid class. So that's what I like to focus on. I focus on the lipid. And in terms of what they look like, they are long chains of carbon and hydrogen molecules. That's why they last so long in the record because they actually, they don't have very complex chemistry. They're very simple hydrocarbons. They're simple, they're not very reactive and that's why they last a long time. But what they look like is just carbon hydrogen chains and we just, uh, we recognize the patterns of what builds up a biomolecule. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, great. Thank you, Erin. So now uh, I'll ask uh, Hiba to unmute and you can ask your question. So my question is, why do the why do this rock look so like a map of like the surface of Mars? Uh, why which rock? Like like it's like a thing like that. It's like a tank. Like a tank. Tank. Are you asking if the rocks, why the rocks on Earth look like rocks on Mars? No, like, yes, yes. Okay. I think physical and chemical properties on both planet are similar. So it's not like we're going to have different elements on Mars. So the, the process that formed the planets re still remain the same, um, at least Mars and Earth. Well, Jupiter and Saturn, they're a little bit different. So that's why uh, rocks on Earth and Mars look similar. Does uh, Do either of you have anything uh, more to add to that? I'll say so some of the reasons that we go to places like Hawaii and Iceland and look for these, these special rocks like the salt. Um, so the, the, the Martian surface, um, it's made a, it, it's a very volcanic surface. Mars is just covered in volcanoes. It actually has one of the, the biggest volcano in the entire solar system is on Mars. And it is just pouring out this kind of um, magma or this kind of lava called basalt. And it's, it's a basaltic lava uh, on Mars just because we don't have things, um, Mars is a smaller planet. We don't have big continents and tectonic motion that recycles a lot of this crust and, and changes its chemistry. So a basalt is actually like a very a young kind of lava that hasn't evolved to a different composition. And so that's why we go to places on Earth that have these very young volcanoes, like Hawaii, those are very new volcanoes. We go to Iceland, very new volcanoes. And those types of rocks are very similar to the types of volcanoes that we have on Mars, because we don't have these broad planetary processes that recycle rocks like we do on Earth. So we have to go to special places on Earth to find the rocks that we find on Mars. Um, but they do exist here because like Dabarati was saying, they're very similar planetary surfaces, you know, the laws of physics we have on Earth also operate on Mars. So we can make these kind of one-to-one -one connections between the planets uh, if, we're, if we're careful and look in the right places. Yeah, and, and maybe I'll just add sort of a, one of the wonderful things of working with such a large science group or science team is whenever something comes up, you know, a, a new image comes down and someone thinks they see something, people start talking about, oh, I've seen a rock like this in Argentina or in Morocco, and people start sharing knowledge from Earth. And so it's, it's an amazing learning experience to just, sometimes you don't have any input, you, you don't know what you're seeing because you maybe haven't worked on that kind of stuff. And people will just inundate the team with uh, information, pictures, knowledge, and uh, that's amazing. Now, now, rocks sometimes are hard to identify. And if you've been following Perseverance, uh, you might know that uh, since the start of the mission, it's the t science team is having difficulty deciding what exactly the rocks are around the rover. 
And uh, I just happen to have an example here, you know, I don't know if you can see this, but it kind of looks like a gray, you know, messy rock that doesn't really show many features. And that's kind of what Perseverance has been seeing. But on Earth, we can cut the rock open and we can polish it and we can see much more what it really looks like on the inside. And that's what we'd love to do on Mars. And, and the rover does have some tools, including drilling, but also an abrasion tool. And we can get at maybe what the rock looks like a little bit. We can also maybe get at it with uh, lasers. So for instance, the SuperCam or the ChemCam on Curiosity can maybe shoot through the outer part of this rock, which doesn't look like much, or maybe it's dusty and, and you know dirty, uh, and get into the interior part of the rock, which is maybe more fresher, more representative of what the rock actually is. So it's not because the scientists are dumb on the team. Uh, they're just not sure exactly what the, the data is telling us from, uh, from Perseverance. Okay, uh, thank, thank you everyone for, uh, for and handling that question. I hope that, I hope that helps Kiva and thanks for asking the question live. Uh, next question is for Devarati. Uh, why are places on earth like Death Valley good analogs for Mars? Good question. Um, like Aaron and Richard said, there, there's not one specific place on earth that is uh, good, that's a good analog. It depends on what you're studying. I am studying minerals that uh, form um, because of evaporation. So I focused on an area which has a lot of these uh, features. And I'm specifically looking for calcium sulfates and borates. So I focused on an area which, which will give me the maximum potential to study this. So I chose a borate mine, um, which also shows the presence of calcium sulfates. So this is a great place. So this will kind of ensure that I will get samples uh, for calcium sulfates, which may or may not have borates. Um, but if, if I went to Iceland to look for borates, I may not have the same success rate. So it's not, it's not the same planet. We're trying to kind of cobble together um, what exactly happened based on the examples that we have access to. So that's why Richard's field area and Aaron's field area are different because they're looking at different aspects of um, the planet. Great, thank you. Thank you, Devarati. Uh, Richard, how has Mars, re Mars research changed in the last decade? Have the new missions helped a lot? Well, uh, oh gosh, that's a great big question. Um, uh, of course, you know, every mission we send to Mars, uh, we're surprised by what we find. You know, we, we think we have an idea, you know, we, we sent Curiosity Gale Crater, you know, there's an impact crater. We think there, were, you know, we, we knew in advance or we thought in advance there were probably some you know, lake sediments and maybe evidence of rivers and so on. And, and sure enough, that's what Curiosity has found. Uh, but there's always surprises. There's always new stuff, things that we didn't think about. And that, that adds to our knowledge base and sort of we build on each, on each mission as we go. So, um, you know, if we go back to the Spirit and Opportunity rovers, you know, rest in peace, both of those, uh, who did an amazing job working on Mars for so many years, uh, their goal was really to search for evidence of past water. You know, so NASA's mantra back then was, you know, search for water. Uh, and uh, uh, both Opportunity and Spirit did find evidence of ancient uh, or, you know, past water on Mars in, you know, very distant past. And that evidence is in the form of certain kinds of rocks that are deposited by water or rocks that have been influenced by water or minerals deposited under certain conditions. And so we sort of check that off the, uh, the list of things to do. And then Curiosity was sent to Gale Crater to really characterize habitable environments. So a habitable environment is an environment that could potentially host life. And, uh, you know, such as a lake where there's liquid water, there's maybe uh, some energy sources in the form of certain minerals that might be present. And there's uh, uh, carbon compounds that of course, you know, all life that we know is based on carbon. So those are the kinds of things we look for in order to characterize an environment as habitable. And so uh, again, with curiosity, we can sort of check that off the list of things to do. It's, you know, it's a little bit more complex than that. Uh, but now Perseverance has gone to another location and it's a long story why, you know, you may say, why don't they just go back to the same place? Well, you know, scientists like diversity and like to go to different places. So Perseverance has now gone to Jezero Crater where we think there's also a lake and there's lake sediments that we, we expect to find. And 
it is going a step further and not just looking for water or looking for habitable environments, but actually trying to look for traces of life, which, as we said, might only be found once we get some of those samples back to Earth, but that's still part of the mission. So it's really a, a sort of a step-by-step -step progressive approach to exploration. And that's kind of what I was saying in the first place. It's not just, you know, one mission here, one mission there. It's really a research program uh, that develops uh, across multiple, uh, multiple missions. So I Thank hope you. that kind of answers the question. Um, it, it, uh, I could maybe talk about this for quite some time, but we'll leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, that's com comprehensive. Mm -hmm. uh, for anyone can take on this question, is there anything done to make robots more sustainable? How can we avoid littering Mars with robots? Well, I'll, I'll start. Uh, right now, we can't uh, really do much uh, if we choose to go. So uh, the majority of people who are involved in this think that it's worth it to uh, do a little tiny bit of littering uh, for the advancement of science. Um, you know, curiosity, uh, perseverance, opportunity, spirit, there's no way of them coming back uh, by themselves. Now, in the future, if humans are going to go to Mars, which Apparently, everyone thinks they should and, and will. Uh, there's nothing stopping a mission to go and collect some of our garbage that we've left there, you know, whether it's on Mars or on the moon and so on. But uh, we've only been to the surface of Mars about, uh, what's the exact number? I'd have to count now, uh, less than a dozen times. And uh, so, you know, on the grand scheme of things, it's a really tiny amount of garbage, but, uh, but nevertheless, it is. And, uh, but we think it's worth it. Um, uh, it's not causing great environmental damage. Uh, these things are pretty inert uh, once they're sitting there uh, and there's nothing stopping us from going to get them um, maybe with humans or some kind of robotic mission in the future, but uh, it's probably easier with humans and bring them back with our humans when they come back. Great, thanks. Yeah, Aaron, to follow up on, on what Richard said, um, I, have, I have two points. The first is that the, the robots that we send to Mars are actually some of the cleanest robots that are ever produced on Earth. They are so extremely well cleaned before they leave our planet, and that is to protect the Martian surface, surface from our contamination. We don't want to contaminate Mars with our biosphere, our microbes, our germs, because we want to look at the Martian biosphere. We want to find Martian germs. So we don't want to actually take our, our, our garbage um, with us and have it contaminate Mars. So our robots are actually extremely well cleaned before they go to Mars. Um, so that's kind of the, the first point. And in terms of leaving little bits of, of robots behind, we do certainly do that. You know, when, we, when, the, when, the, when the rovers land, they have parachutes that get ejected, um, or there's certain parts of the spacecraft that get um, jettisoned uh, as, as the rover is driving, or for example, when Perseverance had to release the Ingenuity helicopter. We had to open up the, the belly pan and that got left behind on the surface of Mars. But those pieces of hardware are so precisely mapped on the surface of Mars. There's maps out there that exist that can, you can find the exact coordinates of these pieces of garbage, these, these parachutes, these belly pans. And they're kind of, I don't know if I want to call them garbage, they're kind of, they'll be museum pieces one day, I'm sure. So they are extremely well mapped. We have a really good idea of, of exactly where we've dropped, um, the where we've polluted uh, Mars with our rovers. And like Richard said, if there's a mission that wants to go forward and either collect those, those items or even turn them into heritage sites, the same way that the, the footprints on the moon are going to become a heritage site. Maybe these, um, these pieces of garbage on Mars will become historic sites of, of the initial exploration. So they're very well tracked and the robots are also very clean before they leave our planet. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, I'll move on to the next question. Does it appear that Mars had a very volcanic past? Nods. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah, so like definitely. Uh, you know, we, we often say that Mars is uh, pretty much, uh, you know, the surface is mostly volcanic. Uh, maybe that's not quite true, uh, but there's certainly lots of evidence of uh, volcanism, uh, lava flows, lava tubes, and of course, volcanoes themselves. I think uh, Aaron mentioned uh, Olympus Mons, the largest volcano in the solar system. There's many others. And the big question scientifically is, until when were these volcanoes active? So there's some debate on 
you know, most people think that they're not active today. So Mars has sort of cooled down as a planet. So all the rocky planets in the inner solar system started off really hot and they've been cooling down ever since. And as I like to say, it's like a baked potato or like baked potatoes. If you cook two potatoes and you take them out of the little one or the smaller one, you'll be able to eat it sooner because it's going to cool down faster. Whereas the bigger one with the bigger mass is going to cool down slower. So Venus and Earth are still cooling down quite a bit. Mercury is cold, the moon is cold, and Mars is, is colder because of the relative size and mass. And so uh, there's definitely evidence of volcanism. Some people think fairly recently on Mars, uh, but for probably not so much uh, uh, today. And, but that, you know, again, Mars sometimes surprises us, and, uh, but definitely a, a, a big history of volcanism. Great, thank you. And then follow up on that, how long do we think water existed on Mars and why do we think it disappeared? I'll let the students answer that one, see what they think. <laughs> uh, that, is a, that is a good question. I, I'll tell you, if you ever, if you go to a, a conference of Mars scientists and you wanna start a heated debate, that is exactly the question you should ask. Or if you know you wanna hear 10 Mars scientists give 11 different answers to a question, that's the question to ask. Um, it's a it's a very it's an open question. It, it's very difficult to study when exactly the water disappeared from Mars and why. Um, although there was a very recent study that came out, I think just in 2020 in the journal Nature, which is a very well respected um, nature in the scientific community, that estimates that the water was probably pretty completely gone from the surface, had almost fully disappeared by about three billion years ago. Um, there's some evidence that. We're also not quite sure what state that water was in in these very later years. There's some studies that maybe the last vestiges of water were tied up in some glaciers that maybe remained frozen on the surface and, and that those ice packs were some of the last to melt before um, disappearing into space uh, or, or into the surface. Now, if to the second part of your question of where did that water go, again, that is a very exciting debate. And there's kind of two possibilities um, that are not necessarily mutually exclusive. So both are kind of fair game. One part is that the water disappeared into space. So Mars is different than Earth in that Mars doesn't have a thick atmosphere or ozone layer like we do on, on Earth. Whereas on Earth, we have this liquid molten core that spins around on the inside of the Earth. It gives us a magnetic field and it protects us from what's called the solar wind, which any physicists out there, these sort of energetic particles that are uh, traveling outward from the sun, um, we're protected from those here on Earth, but Mars is not because it does not have a magnetic field. And so that solar wind actually stripped away Mars's atmosphere very early in its history, about four, three or four billion years ago. And once that stripped away, then the surface of Mars was essentially exposed to space. And so the temperature fell dramatically. Mars today is on the order of minus 60 to minus 20 degrees um, on average. And the pressure also fell. So at, at those conditions at these low temperatures and these low pressures, Liquid water is just not stable at the surface. So it, it sublimated or evaporated, it turned into vapor and it was just lost to space. It kind of, it blew away. And so it was lost into, into the solar system. Another option is that it um, retracted into the surface and then it's been tied up in some minerals. There is some evidence for hydrated minerals on the surface. So these are minerals that have water as a fundamental component of their crystal structure. So we do know that some water on Mars was actually just kind of taken into the surface up by the planet. Now, how much water could be existing subsurface? There is some evidence of subsurface lakes, um, and we don't know the extent of what those subterranean aquifers could be. So there is some possibility that there could be storage of water deep down underground, and whether that's in liquid or frozen form, we don't really know. So it's a, it's a very good question that we don't really have a good answer for. But if you're interested in studying Martian science, or if you're an early career professional looking for a way to study Mars, that is a, a broad open field to get into. Great, thank you so much. I'll, uh, I'll go forward to the next question. And it's during all the recent explorations of the planet, what has surprised the scientific community go most and made it go, huh? I think that happens all the time. There's like, you think that this is the most surprising thing, but then something happens again. And then, you, then all the Mars scientists are like, huh? I think the most recent one was uh, that Perseverance rover tried to drill, drill, drill a hole and then 
tried to pull it out and there was nothing there but i let richard and aaron <laughs> answer that one more but there are a lot of things that mars just makes us go huh all the time <laughs> uh yeah i don't know aaron if you want to you want to talk about that but that's the the case of the disappearing rock core <laughs> uh you know maybe it was just a very loosely consolidated rock and and you know sometimes you know we, we talked a lot tonight about learning from earth you know going to places on earth and what we call sometimes these analog environments and uh that's all fine and you know nice and it, it can be very useful but it also uh instills this bias with you know in us and so we're biased by what we know from earth and and what we've seen on earth and you know the way things operate on earth we do have to remember that mars is a different planet and you know although the laws of nature and you know physics and chemistry apply uh there are some differences and uh you know aaron was was hinting at some with you know the pressure and temperature that's very different liquid water is not stable on the surface you know what was it like in the past we often talk about a wetter uh, a wetter, warmer Mars in the past, uh, and and I think for some time a lot of people thought, well, it was you know tropical Mars, you know, back in the early Mars, Mars's early history. Uh, but it may be that it was only slightly warmer than it is today, and we maybe only had certain periods of time uh, where uh, temperatures were much temperatures were much above zero, and therefore we had lakes and rivers and so on. So those could be very sort of short periods of time relatively in the grand scheme of things uh, where there is liquid water on Mars. So um, uh, yeah, so, you know, we, we have to be careful. We do have biases. And like I said, you know, missions always surprise us whenever we go someplace new on Mars, we're surprised by a lot of things that we found. And maybe I'll let Aaron talk and I'll think about some, an example of a surprise. <laughs> Just like the other two panelists, so, so often. <laughs> I've been on a couple of shifts recently and it's um, we have this very cool instrument on perseverance that allows us to scrape away about the top two centimeters of a rock. And just like Richard showed earlier, you know, we would, we would approach these rocks that look, you know, kind of dusty and bland, very smooth on the surface. And you scrape away two millimeters and then you take a photograph and it's just full of diverse textures and colors and, and different shapes and, and angular grains and are they grains or are they crystals? And it was so funny looking at the, um, we have a chat associated with the Perseverance uh, mission and, and every message that was coming in was, I didn't know what to expect, but I wasn't expecting that. And it was just, none of us had had thought to expect this, this wild texture buried just two millimeters below the surface of these very kind of boring looking rocks. And then getting to what Dvarati um, mentioned, we actually, we drilled into one of these very cool, beautiful um, kaleidoscope type rocks. And this was, we were very excited. This was gonna be our very first sample of the mission. We were gonna drill in, pick up a piece of rock. It was going to be an iconic moment. And we, we drilled in, we retracted our drill and we, we peeked inside to take a photograph and there was nothing there. And it was, <laughs> let me tell you, it was, it was a couple of days of just head scratching and, and late nights for the engineers trying to figure out what had possibly happened to this rock. We didn't, we didn't know at first whether we had dropped it or whether maybe we hadn't pulled it out of the hole or what had happened. So we backed up the rover, we took, a photo, we took photographs of the whole area. We didn't see any rock lying on the ground. There was an empty hole. So we knew we picked it up. We knew we hadn't dropped it. The only explanation is that the act of drilling was so aggressive that it just powdered this rock and it kind of disappeared into the sand around us. But so that was definitely a head scratcher. It took us a couple of days to figure that one out. And, and we didn't expect it to happen. You know, we thought we had this hard cohesive rock that would make a beautiful drill core. And it, it just crumbled into sand in our, in our robot hands. So yes, Mars is, is a huge surprise. It's, it's, it's hard to do science at the best of times. And it's even harder to do science 250 million kilometers away with, with a robot that you have to operate like every other day. So it's, always surprises us. It's, it's almost never what you expect on Mars. Wonderful. And, and of course, if you know anything about geology, you know there's three main types of rocks, you know, sedimentary rocks, igneous rocks, and metamorphic rocks. Uh, on Mars, not too many metamorphic rocks, so we can sort of uh, remove that out of the picture, but um, often is the case, both curiosity and perseverance, where we have, you know, a rock with all kinds of pictures and data from all the different instruments, 
and you have half the team who thinks it's a sedimentary rock and half the team who thinks it's an igneous rock. You know, basic sort of questions, sometimes it's really hard to answer when you're working, you know, with a robot so far away. So uh, it can be frustrating at times because, you know, we want to know, of course, and uh, sometimes we just, you know, can't know for sure. And I like to tell the story of the Blue Rock, uh, which was uh, a rock that was uh, photographed by Curiosity, if, you know, many years ago or a few years ago. And the image came down, it looked like a blue rock. And then the email started getting uh, active. People on the team sending emails with pictures of their favorite blue rock from all parts of the world, around the world. I had about 60 mission related emails that day. And the next day, Curiosity took a, a picture at a different time of day. So the illumination was different and the rock looked pretty much gray. And then all the blue rock emails went down and no one ever talked about blue rocks after that. So, uh, you know, lighting can play a trick on you. Uh, and, uh, but people are of course, genuinely excited. And they thought this was a blue rock on Mars, <laughs> but it wasn't. <laughs> great, great. Uh, but there are related, blue rocks on earth. <laughs> I mean, turquoise, <laughs> but <laughs> Yeah, I guess our next question is, uh, what is your best memory of your travels or of being involved in missions? I'll answer that. Um, someone asked about Death Valley. Um, it was my first self self-planned kind of mission. I was a bit of a lab rat before that. So I didn't really know. I don't also drive. So navigation was just a different kind of hell for me. Um, so I guess it was, I mean, it wasn't the best memory as I was forming it. But um, when I look back, uh, it was a bit of, uh, you know, like it, I learned so much. And when I look back, um, I went to Death Valley and the name said Death Valley, but there was so much life. There was so much weird life. There was like super bloom of uh, poppies and desert turtles that if you pick up will uh, pee out all their body uh, fluids and just die, which is ridiculous. Uh, <laughs> but all kinds of different life, which made me really think about, wow, a place that is known to be harsh and is called Death Valley has so much potential for life, really inspired me to keep looking for, you know, like our search for our collective search for life on a planet that appears dead um, it is very valid and it's, uh, it's exciting. So that's kind of a vague answer for what my best memory is, but it's a good feeling. And uh, Richard and Aaron might have different answers to that. Yeah, Aaron, please go ahead, Richard. Do you, want, do you want to say anything? Sure. I was just going to say, honestly, it was the team that I met when I was, um, when I went to Hawaii with the basalt team, it was a team of about probably 40 or 60 people when I was down there. And they were simply the most inspiring, meritorious people I'd ever met. Everybody you talked to was a volunteer firefighter or a hobby marathon runner or an ultra. It was just, it was an incredible group of people and they were all united by this love of science. And that's honestly kind of what, what, catalyzed my love for this field and what made me want to stay in, in in studying Mars it was like the science is incredible and the people that I get to work with are just so motivated and just so excited excited and exciting outside of their work and so the, the best memories were honestly just talking with other members of the team seeing what excited them and just feeling so grateful to be around these incredible inspiring people and just wanting to be like them um and so that, that's been the best memory. It's just meeting the people in this community. They're all so incredible and so motivating and aspirational. And, and I think we can all probably agree uh, as, as three geologists, you know, a lot of the reason why we've studied geology is, is to get out into nature, out into the field and go to these amazing places like Death Valley or Hawaii or whatever. I've had the chance to go to um, uh, a number of amazing places, including Hawaii, of course, but also to the high Arctic and all the way up to Eureka in, uh, in Nunavut. And, and so it's really, and working with amazing people, like Aaron just said. And, and now, you know, my big motivation is, is, is to, you know, mentor students and to give them opportunities to go do similar things. And, and one big regret I have is not being able to go to Death Valley and to act as your driver. <laughs> <laughs> Next. We'll, we'll go somewhere sometime. Yeah. yeah. 
<laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, so everyone watching, I have permission from the panelists to keep asking some questions for a little while, for a little while longer, because we're getting, we still have lots, uh, lots to go through. So uh, carrying on, can we differentiate between biofossils for different organisms? Maybe this is a question for Aaron. Um, yes, absolutely. We can we can distinguish uh, biofossils from different organisms, and that's one of the the exciting parts about about biosignatures. Uh, that said, biofossils is kind of a very broad umbrella term, so it depends what kind of um, biofossil you're looking at. Again, if we're looking at something, if we have a very recent biofossil, so we have maybe a little bit of preserved DNA, um, that's going to be very hyper specific. That's going to tell you precisely what species it came from, and so we can do these very specific organism studies um, with those kind of early fossils. The further we try to march back in time, the kind of less, the more coarse our resolution gets, the less that we can distinguish some of these organisms. But even with something like a lipid, which can survive potentially millions to billions of years, we can still distinguish, you know, the three main domains of life. We can just, we can tell that this is a bacterial lipid versus a eukaryotic lipid. So like a higher level organism, or even from an archaeal lipid. So we can, we can pull out those three classes of life and tell like what kind of community we have. Certain lipids can also tell us maybe these organisms were using sulfur to get energy. So we can look for um, sulfur metabolism uh, biosignatures. So we don't, with something like a lipid, you're kind of losing the specificity of something like DNA, but you're gaining that preservation potential. So Yes, to your question of we can distinguish different types of life, but the further we try to look back in time, kind of the, the less resolution we have, but we still do have some capacity and some techniques to, to pull those things out. And frankly, science is always advancing and we're getting better and better at recognizing what these biosignatures look like. And we're building up bigger and bigger catalogs so that we can cross check and understand what we're looking at when we find a new biofossil. Okay, thank you. Richard? Yeah, maybe I'll just add, of course, we have to keep in mind, you know, as a fan of science fiction, that uh, we might not find something that looks like Earth life. You know, it is possible, though purely speculative, that there's life on Mars or there was life on Mars that is different than life on Earth. And that, you know, leads to the question, well, how would we identify it? How would we discover it? You know, for the most part, we're thinking all the time microbial life. Uh, you know, there's no evidence that there was any complex life like big trees or elephants or dinosaurs, or whatever, on Mars. But there's reasonable evidence that points to the possibility of simple, you know, microbial life. Uh, but that's, again, from what we know on, on Earth. And uh, could Mars surprise us in that respect? Uh, perhaps. We, uh, we need to keep looking. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, I'll ask a question about ingenuity. Uh, why is it more complicated to fly a helicopter on Mars than on Earth? So many reasons. <laughs> um, I, will, I will qualify my answer by saying that I am not myself on the ingenuity team. Perseverance and ingenuity are operated by separate uh, entities and ingenuity is very much uh, an engineering project and I am very much a scientist on the perseverance side, but I will do my best to answer your question based on what I've heard from my fellow team members. And that is that, well, the, the first part is the Martian atmosphere is much thinner than the earth atmosphere. So you don't have as much air resistance to buffet your, um, your helicopter blades against. So you, it takes a lot more power and energy to push against the air um, to give yourself lift. So that's why the, the blades on Ingenuity rotate so fast because they're really trying to build up um, that force to lift them up. And the other thing is actually the density of the Martian atmosphere changes throughout the season. So Ingenuity was actually only supposed to be active at the very early days of the Perseverance mission. And we knew that that happened to be the dense atmosphere season on Mars. You don't think of, of atmosphere density as a season on Earth, but it is on Mars. And we are actually entering a season now of lower atmospheric density. And so every flight that we continue to fly Ingenuity actually gets harder and harder and harder. Um, and there's gonna be a time potentially when that helicopter won't be getting off the ground. But that's one of, one of the things that makes it hard is the Martian atmosphere actually changes through time. So engineering something that can get off the ground and be robust enough to weather these seasonal changes of atmospheric density and operate at all times is extremely, extremely difficult. And the other side of that, so we know the Martian atmosphere is difficult to fly in. 
it's hard to practice in, right? So when we're, when we're building robots on earth or when, like when you're building, when you're trying to design a new car, it would go through so many field tests, right? You would, you would try these things out. You would, you would notice the mistakes, you would fix them. You would, you would iterate with trying to build a helicopter on Mars. You can't just go outside and, and give it a practice flight. And it's really hard to build large scale chambers that simulate the Martian atmosphere to, to practice this test flight. Cause you have to simulate the, the lower gravity as well as the thin atmosphere. There's so many variables. So trying to fly in, in a thin atmosphere with low gravity and not really having much opportunity to practice all kind of compound to make it a very difficult task and just an incredible example of engineering. The fact that that helicopter got off the ground, not once, not twice, not three times, but we're looking at like more than a dozen at this point. And it's just an incredible little, a little, little machine. Wonderful. Uh, next question. What is your favorite fictional depiction of Mars in film or literature? Sorry, I, th I think I missed a part of that question. Can you repeat that, uh, please? What is your favorite fictional depiction of Mars in film or literature? I think <laughs> hearkening, well, I don't know if it, it's film or literature, or, well, I guess it's literature, but hearkening back to the very, very early days of, of Mars exploration, um, there were these very early telescopic uh, observations of, that, that looked at Mars and they thought they saw these squiggly lines on the surface. It turned out to just be optical distortion in the telescopes, but the original interpretation that it was actually these, these channels that snaked across the surface. And then that actually got mistranslated between, I, I think it was the original Italian astronomers uh, to the rest of the world. They had written down, you know, we see channels on Mars and it got interpreted as, as canals because they use the word canali. And so I, I like this, this vision of very uh, posh, fancy Italian Venice style canals snaking their way through Mars and having uh, fancy Martians drinking wine on the surface. That was kind of the very early image of, of, of Mars. Uh, before we had any instruments even even entering space. So I kind of like this uh, rustic Italian version of, of Mars from the early literature. I, I've never pictured Martians drinking wine, but thank you for that, Erin. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> I mean, if there's canals, you have to have a little glass of canal side wine. Nice, <laughs> thank you. Sometimes yeah. we discussed before, Mars just throws us so many, you know, thrillers that I feel like we don't need fiction because it's just yeah. so exciting as is that we can't keep up with um, the excitement. Although, like, you know, what our imaginations are also quite a nice place to explore. <laughs> well, of course, it's, it's such a large team. There's there's a few interesting characters. <laughs> also, <laughs> I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Yeah, especially with like uh, how the different teams uh, work with each other because, because there are so many teams, there are so many instruments and how what the team dynamics between the teams are, are also, it's like a telenovela, you know, so it's pretty, pretty great. Um, I'll also leave it at that. <laughs> great, thank you. Uh, would you like to go yourself on Mars to study it closer if you had the opportunity? Well, I get motion sickness in a planetarium, so no. <laughs> but in theory, yes, I would love to go to Mars. I will throw up the whole way, but I would love to go to Mars. <laughs> I would like to explore Mars as long as a return trip is on the table. This, this recent talk of a one-way trip to Mars, I am not down for. <laughs> I think half the fun of going to Mars is being able to come back and tell your friends about it share photos, <laughs> so as long as, yeah, as long as there's a return ticket in there, I, I think I, would, I wouldn't mind going. <laughs> yeah, maybe when my kids are older and, you know, moved on from home, uh, and if we can make the trip a little bit quicker. <laughs> All right, fair. So uh, I think I'll wrap it up with one last question. Uh, you've mentioned often that scientists study Earth to better understand Mars, but could the opposite also be true? As in, would studying Mars tell us more about Earth, its future and its past? Yeah, absolutely. That's actually, that's, that's one of my favorite things to think about. There's this um, kind of incredible idea in, in 
the astrobiology sphere, studying life on Mars to better understand life on Earth. And part of that is that, so we think that life emerged on Earth somewhere on the order of three and a half, 3.9, 4 billion years ago on our planet. That's when we think the first life forms were getting started here. Now, unfortunately, we don't really have many rocks that are that old. So we don't think that we have a fossil record of the very first organisms left on Earth because you know rocks on Earth, they get recycled. We have plate tectonics, rocks get subducted, they turn back into magma and they blow up in volcanoes. So we have a, an active rock cycle that has probably scrubbed away any evidence of the very first life forms on Earth. But the incredible thing about Mars is there's no plate tectonics. Some of the rocks on Mars are still 4 billion years old. There are huge plains of Mars that are full of rocks that are this, this old, this ancient. And so maybe if, if Earth and Mars were both inhabited at similar times, if life got a hold on both planets, there's many theories that both planets could have kind of cross-contaminated each other with, with meteorite transfer. So if, if Mars maybe has a rock record that records these earliest signs of life, it might actually be our best chance to understand these first life forms on Earth because we don't have those rocks available here and they are there for the picking on Mars. And so I think that is such an incredible way that we could understand Earth better by studying Mars. Thank you. We also get to um, experience a lot of innovative technology um, here on Earth because we are trying to um, send missions to other planets and because of space technology, there's a lot of stuff that we get to experience here on um, Earth too. So not just from a geology perspective, maybe from tech perspective too. And, and just as a little historical account, the our understanding of impact craters uh, was really helped by the study of uh, lunar impact craters, and maybe to some extent Mars craters, uh, because of course, I kind of as Aaron was hinting, we can see them there much more, much much better, and they're much better preserved. Uh, so indeed, yeah, there are reasons uh, we can we can look elsewhere to understand our own home. Wonderful. Thank you all for answering that question. Uh, that'll be where I cut it tonight. Do you have any last minute comments? This was like some really awesome questions. Really enjoyed um, talking to all of you. Thanks for organizing this. Yeah, really diverse. And, and if, if we didn't get to your question in the chat or on the line or on YouTube, um, I think Dabarati and I and Richard as well, we're all very active on, on Twitter. And I think most of us have a, have a planetary science theme to our Twitter feeds. Um, so if you, wanna, if you wanna meet us there, I'm sure Leah has our contact information. Dabarati had some on her slides, but um, I'm, I'm very open to follow up. If you have Martian questions, I'm happy to spend my whole day talking about Mars. So feel free to reach out. Not every day, but some days. Not every day. <laughs> Yeah, awesome. great. It, this is always fun to do. Of course, people are so uh, so into it and with great questions. Uh, keep uh, keep tuning into these kinds of events. Keep uh, encouraging Astro McGill, and uh, not only for Mars stuff, but for uh, for other things. And uh, it really makes it worthwhile for us to to work on this kind of stuff and to be able to share it not only with our colleagues and you know other scientists and, and those boring types, but you know uh, people from all ages and all walks of life. Whether you are a scientist or a scientist in another field or not a scientist at all, uh, but you're very interested in this kind of stuff. So uh, we, uh, we really appreciate that. And uh, thanks for tuning in. All right, thank you very much to all three of our panelists. I will ask all of everyone who is on the Zoom and on the YouTube, please type your thanks into the chat. And uh, yeah, we'll make sure they get those comments. So thank you everyone for tuning in. We'll have more events from the Astrophysics McGill public live stream soon, and we'll keep you posted on our social media and email channels. So and thanks again, everyone. Final... Have a good night. Uh, Carolina. Yeah, I was going to yes. say, I uh, just going to say thanks to Leah for like awesome moderation. So I'm going to call you out there. Uh, yeah. Thanks, thanks for making it easy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Have a good night, everyone. Good night.